Who do you think is the greatest in Emmanuel Church Bramkett? Who do you like the most? Who do you most look up to and admire? Who's the greatest? If you were to take the address book and to put it in order of greatness, from greatest to least great, who would be at the top? Actually, I quite like the current order. I think that's about right, with the, with the Adams first. But who would you put first? Now, that might seem like a ridiculous question, as if we would ever do that. That would be really crass to try and organise the address book in order of greatness, wouldn't it? But isn't that something we're subtly doing all the time? Ordering people in terms of assessing people, in terms of how great we think they are? If we look at the people that we've got in touch with, the priority, the order that we've got in touch with people over lockdown, and those that we haven't got in touch with, isn't that in part a reflection of who we think is the greatest? And aren't we often trying to work our way up the ranks, trying to um, it, it make our, ourselves great in the eyes of others? Who's the greatest in Emmanuel Church, Bramkirk? Well, as we've been looking through Matthew's Gospel, we've seen that Jesus is God's King. And he's setting up a, a kingdom where he will reign. And as with any kingdom, there is a certain amount of jostling for position going on amongst his disciples. And so this question comes up, who is the greatest? We're going to read the passage together. It's from Matthew chapter 18 and verses 1 to 14. Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 to 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened round his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Who is the greatest in Emmanuel Church Bramcourt? Well, Jesus in this passage has three lessons to teach us. And the first one is this, that the humble are the greatest in the kingdom. Verses one to four. The humble are the greatest in the kingdom. In verse one, the disciples ask that question of Jesus. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They know that Jesus is going to Jerusalem and despite all the warnings that he's been giving them, that they still think that when he gets there, he's going to be recognised as king and establish his kingdom and they want to know what position they're going to get. Who is the greatest? And so to answer them, Jesus uses a visual aid. Now, uh, I have one of these visual aids somewhere here. Where did I put my visual aid? Come here. There we are. Jesus takes a child and he puts them in the midst of them and he says, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's actually quite a heavy visual aid, so I'm going to put it down now. Unless you turn and become like a child, you will not even enter the kingdom. Forget about who is the greatest. Unless you turn and become like a child, you will not even enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse three. A child has no status. However much we might love our children, however much affection we might feel for them, that they're not looked up to, they're not admired, they're not great. 
Their situation, their status is humble. And Jesus is saying that we need to become like that if we are to enter his kingdom. It means that we need to turn away from pride and to turn away from boasting. I remember in a youth group I was involved in, there was a young man who was constantly boasting, making things up uh, that he could boast in about how great he was. I remember a trip to an ice skating rink and he was telling us about what a great skater he was and all the tricks that he'd done. And it was ridiculous, it was absurd, because as soon as we got to that rink, it became very, very clear that he'd never been ice skating in his life. It was ridiculous, it was all make-believe. And yet, isn't that the nature of all our boasting? All the things we boast about, all the things that we're proud of, and we take pride in, it's all make-believe. It's a pretense that we are something great, something good. When the reality is that all we have to bring to God is our sin, our rebellion against him. The reality is that Jesus is going to Jerusalem, not actually to be crowned as king, but to die on the cross to take the penalty we deserve for our sin. And to enter his kingdom means to give up on the pretense that we are something great and special. And to recognise that we can only enter, not because we deserve to enter, but because we are entirely dependent on what Jesus has done for us. We can only enter because of God's grace and kindness to us. We need to turn from pride and become like children and humble ourselves like a child in order to enter the kingdom. I wonder, have you done that? Have you become, turned and become like a child? Or is pride stopping you from following Jesus? Note the solemn words here. Unless you become, turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you have entered, are you pursuing true greatness? Not the greatness that is, is trying to exalt yourself above others, but the greatness that comes from God, the greatness that in, involves humbling ourselves and putting others first. Because the humble are the greatest in the kingdom. Secondly, Jesus teaches us, don't let pride, your pride, cause others to stumble. This is verses five to nine. Don't let pride cause others to stumble. Imagine that you're in a supermarket and you're doing your shopping, and while you're doing that, you suddenly spot a child by themselves, on their own, um, and and they're crying they're in floods of tears. And you go over to them and say, what, what on earth is the matter? And they say, I can't find my mummy anywhere. And so you put your arm around them and you lead them to the customer services desk. And whilst the message goes out over the tanner, you hold their hand and comfort them until a couple of minutes later, a very flustered mother comes along and scoops up the child in her arms. And she turns to you and she says, thank you so much. And you might think to yourself, well, why are you thanking me? It, it was the child that I helped. I, I haven't done anything for you. I've never even met you. But of course, that mother cares deeply about that child. And so whatever you do for that child, you are doing for the mother. And so she is grateful. Well, Jesus says, uh, saying that that same dynamic is at work with him. Verse five, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Now, when Jesus talks here about um, a child, this child, or one such child, and, and throughout the rest of the passage, he talks about little ones. He's referring, verse six, to these little ones who believe in me. In other words, the, the child, the little ones, is, is referring to all Christians. We are all God's children. We are all little ones who have had to humble ourselves to become like children in order to enter the kingdom. That's who God, uh, Jesus is talking to. But, but as this passage is di um, directed particularly at his disciples, who are the leaders of the church, it becomes clear that he has a particular emphasis when he's talking about little ones. He has a particular emphasis on those who are vulnerable, those who are looked down on or maybe ignored, in danger of being ignored in the church. He is particularly thinking of those who would come bottom of our list if we were to order the directory in terms of greatness. And it's those little ones in particular that Jesus is saying, whatever you do for them, 
when you receive them, when you welcome them, you are doing it for me. But the converse is also true. Verse 6. Just imagine that you're in the park and you see some children playing and they're smiling and they're laughing. They're having a fantastic time. And one of them just happens to skip past you. And, and as they're skipping past, you just stick out your foot and trip them up. And they go flying onto the concrete. And there's cuts and bruises and blood and tears. And then their mother comes across. What, is, what does she say to you? What, what does she think of what you've done? Well, however angry she might be about how you've treated her child, it really pales into insignificance compared to the anger that Jesus uh, feels for those who would trip up one of his little ones. Do you see that in verse 6? Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. If you look at the footnotes um, in, in your Bible, in the ESV translation, uh, where it says sin, that literally means to stumble. Whoever trips up one of these little ones, well, they're in big trouble. In fact, they're in such big trouble that it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened round his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Death by drowning is preferable to having to face Jesus when you've tripped up one of his little ones. It's quite a stark image, isn't it? Quite strong words. What does it mean? Well, to cause a little one to stumble to sin, it's not talking about sinning that a Christian might commit and then repent of, that the kind of day-to-day -day sins that we all commit. It is talking rather about causing a Christian to stumble and to fall in such a way that they stop following Jesus altogether. And in particular, I think Jesus has in mind the way that our pride can act to cause others to stumble. The way that when we are haughty, and we don't recognise the value of certain other Christians. We don't talk to them. We ignore them. That discourages them and causes them to stumble. Or maybe when we boast and we try and exalt ourselves above others, we try and make ourselves seem superior to others. And in the process, we make others feel inferior, which is the whole point, isn't it? But in such a way that it discourages them and they fall away. Or maybe it's when in our arrogance, we deliberately tempt others. And into sin in such a way that they stop following Jesus. Any way that pride, that our pride hurts other Christians and causes them to fall away. Well, that is us uh, tripping them up. That is us causing these little ones to stumble. And Jesus takes that very, very seriously indeed. Which means we need to ask ourselves, are we guilty of this? We need to examine ourselves. Are we living lives that are proud and arrogant and haughty? Are we in danger of actually discouraging others and turning them away from, from the faith? And it may be that as we do that, we realise that we ourselves have never actually turned and humbled ourselves and become like little children. You know, sadly, there are all too many people in church, more generally, who see religion as a way of exalting themselves, a way of making out that they're, they're something special, something great. An awful lot of people who have never actually entered the kingdom of heaven. And if you examine yourself and you realise that you are full of pride, it may well be that you have never turned. And you need to do that. You need to turn and humble yourself in order to enter the kingdom. But I'm confident that for most people watching this video, that's not the case. I'm confident that for most of us, we have turned, we have humbled ourselves. We are seeking to follow Jesus in humility. But can you see from these verses and from verses seven um, to, to nine as well, which just um, emphasise what Jesus is saying in verse six. Can you see just how seriously Jesus takes the sin of pride, just how much he hates it and just how concerned he is when his little ones are hurt? we're seeking to follow Jesus, then we need to examine ourselves. We need to hunt down and to destroy any sign of pride in our lives. We need to look out for any way that we might be lacking in love towards the more vulnerable Christians in our congregation, towards any Christians in our congregations. We need to make sure that we don't let pride cause others to stumble. 
Thirdly, don't despise the little ones, verses 10 to 14. Don't despise, don't look down on others in the church. That word despise literally means look down. It means to, to see people and think they're really not worthwhile. They're really not worth bothering with. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't do that to any Christian. Don't do that particularly to those who might seem insignificant in the church. And he gives us two reasons why we shouldn't do that. Firstly, in verse 10, he says, I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. The, the prime minister of this country, he will have lots and lots of people trying to get his attention, trying to speak to him regularly. And he has to decide who he is going to uh, ignore, who he's going to disregard and who he is going to allow into his presence, who he's going to allow to speak to. He's got to decide who is it that he actually cares about, what are the issues that he cares about and what are the issues that he's just not interested in. Well, what does it say that the sovereign, glorious creator and ruler of this universe, well, he is constantly uh, seeing the angels of these little ones. Verse 10 is, is a little bit tricky to know exactly what, what that means uh, when it talks about their angels. Is it saying that Christians have guardian angels who constantly represent us to the Father? If that was the case, you'd expect to hear that taught elsewhere in the Bible, which we don't really see. So it's, it's tricky to know quite what that means. But the broad point is actually crystal clear, isn't it? It's that, it's that God the Father is constantly paying attention to the welfare of these little ones. He is constantly interested in how they are doing. He is constantly thinking about them. That person that you don't give a second thought to, God is constantly thinking of them. So don't you think that you should regard them maybe a bit more highly? But the second reason in verses 12 to 13 is that God goes to enormous lengths to find his little ones when they stray. God is like a man who has a hundred sheep. One of them goes astray. And the man is not concerned just to have a flock. As long as I've got a flock, I'm happy. It doesn't matter if one or two sheep uh, disappear because I've got my flock. No, this shepherd is particularly concerned for the individual. That individual sheep, he cares about that. And so he leaves the 99 on the mountains and he goes in search of that one that has gone astray. And when he finds that one sheep, what does he do? Well, he rejoices. He's overjoyed that that lost sheep is found. And in the same way, God is not just concerned to have a people. And it doesn't matter if one or two get lost at the edges. No, God is passionately concerned for the individual. God is passionately concerned for each one of his little ones. He goes to great lengths to find them when they stray and he rejoices over them when they are found. Shouldn't our attitude be the same? When people seem to be drifting in their faith, shouldn't we be going to great lengths to try and bring them back in? Look, we're not God. There's a limit as to how much we can do. But shouldn't we be trying? And that's particularly important at the moment in lockdown when we're not able to meet together. And shouldn't we be rejoicing when those little ones are found again? Don't despise, don't look down on Jesus' little ones. As we look at this passage, doesn't it just remind us of how wonderful the kingdom of heaven is? This is a kingdom where the greatest are not those who are able to push their way to the front and step on others. This is a kingdom where the humble are seen as the greatest. This is a king where the weak are protected, where the vulnerable are honoured. This is a king where the, the supreme and glorious creator of the universe is passionately concerned for each individual. Isn't this a wonderful kingdom for us to be part of? Let's make sure that we live by the values of this kingdom. Humility, turning away from all pride and love for one another and particularly for those who are vulnerable in our congregation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this kingdom. We thank you for the example of Jesus, that he was ready to humble himself and come to suffer and to die for us. Oh, Father, will you help us 
to have that same attitude. Father, please show us where we are proud. Please show us where we allow pride to get in the way in our relationships with one another in the church, where we try to exalt ourselves. Please show us, Father, where we are in danger of hurting others and discouraging others in their faith because of our pride. And please, Father, help us to turn from that pride, to humble ourselves and to receive the little ones, uh, knowing that we're receiving you as we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.